So um, what I'm going to kind of talk about today is our experiences. Um, we've been working with data, but particularly visualised data, information visualisations, um, as a means of supporting creativity and design workshops. So uh, I'm going to rush through it, but I'll give a bit of a background, kind of theoretical background, um, some idea of what the data we've been working with and the projects we've been working on, um, run through a case study of a design workshop, which was something we ran with E.ON um, in Milton Keynes. Um, and then I'm going to go through some of the lessons we've learned, not just in that case study, but in the wider work we've been doing. Um, and then, <coughs> probably won't be time, but I'll flick through what we're going to be working on in future. So, data. Um, I guess something that's fairly kind of key and obvious almost to say now is that the amount of data that we're leaving behind, particularly in everyday activities, I mean, it just grows ridiculously. Uh, how many of you have smartphones or use social media um, or fitness trackers or personal health monitors? Um, and if you're, well, I mean, everyone here is pretty much from the UK, so the chances are you either have or at some point in time soon will have a smart energy meter or the kind of smart plugs or smart thermostats that collect and generate uh, high volumes of, of data uh, Massively, um, uh, uh, massive, uh, massively close intervals, so really, really short periods of time, 30 seconds, uh, a minute, things like that. Um, and the thing about this data is that, that government organisations are beginning to see this as, as a kind of a key way to tackle uh, major societal issues. So things like um, the Department of Energy and Climate Change see smart meters uh, or the data from smart meters as a key driver for services that are going to reduce peaks in demand energy, so flatten out the pattern uh, of energy consumption. And what that's going to allow them to do is close down old and dirty uh, power stations and therefore meet some of their environmental targets. But how do we gain value from an understanding from this data? So I guess most of the current techniques are what you'd call big data techniques. So based on statistics, based on machine learning, um, things that are very good at telling us what happens, uh, where it happens, when it happens, um, good at identifying correlations. Um, but they're less useful at telling us why something happens um, and not very good particularly at explanation or causation. So what we've been doing is we've been looking at it slightly differently. Uh, uh, and we hope this is just a complementary technique. It's not saying that big data techniques are useless, go away, stop doing all this massive number crunching. You know, they have their place, but they also have their limitations. So what we're trying to do is, is use the human creativity of stakeholders, people who understand the context that the data comes from. And we want that so that we can get them to help us understand why certain events happened. And if we understand why an event happens, then perhaps we can design a more suitable, a more effective intervention. And the way we do this is to use uh, visualisations of the data and also some applied creativity techniques. And that way what we want to do is we want to make the data more accessible and engaging to the participants. <coughs> and then we want to stimulate their imagination so that they can tell us about context. So all of this kind of builds on some existing theoretical work. Um, and most of this is kind of the, the, the applied creativity side. Um, comes from things like the Osborne Pan's creativity, uh, creative problem solving method. Um, and that kind of shows us that facilitated rounds of divergent and then convergent thinking, um, that, that this can help us identify a problem. It can help us look through the potential solution space and help us focus on an effective solution. And this kind of work have been, uh, has been carried on into design workshops. Um, some point in time, I'm sure you'll hear Neil talk about the uh, stuff they've been doing with uh, air traffic control and various other places in which uh, techniques from applied creativity are placed inside stakeholder um, design workshops. And that's kind of what we're building on here. Um, but also there's another strand of this applied creativity, and that comes from making things, and that comes from things like collage and model building. Um, and, and here, what's been shown is that, that the act of making helps to 
elicit understanding from, from stakeholders' future experiences. So it lets them to talk creatively about how they would like something to be in the future. And then another key aspect of what we do is look at is information visualization techniques. So information visualization is basically computer supported, interactive visual representations of abstract data with the aim of supporting or augmenting human cognition in, its all, in all its forms. And so it uses computational power to refine and filter data. And then visual variables such as color, size, position, to, to utilize the power of, of human perceptual thought so that you know, people are very good at spotting outliers, very good at spotting patterns. Um, and this allows, this visual way of looking at the data allows you to uh, explore some fairly complex data sets in a much more easy fashion. And informational visualization has also been associated with uh, creativity for these kind of reasons. The fact that it allows you to rapidly compare alternative hypotheses uh, allows you to, to generate and, and test these competing hypotheses and, and that aids creative exploration. So what you're doing is you're supporting a user's sense making and therefore allowing them to sort of generate and create new knowledge. So how do we put this into practice? Well I'm going to talk about one of the instances uh, and this was a service design workshop in Milton Keynes with uh, customers and staff from Eon Energy. Um, and a little bit of background on the customers that were involved. Um, they've been taking part in an ongoing long-term technology trial where their houses have been retrofitted with smart meters, with all kinds of smart plugs. Some of them have solar panels. Various kinds of future energy technologies. So they're fairly savvy um, about how data is being collected um, and how energy is being affected by uh, the data that's being collected. And, 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 and the objective that we were looking for in this workshop was to come up with ideas for services that could use this data that's being generated in, in so-called smart homes um, to benefit the occupants. And, and in addition, what we did with the scenario, we introduced the idea of variable variable pricing across the day because that's considered one of the key drivers towards this idea of flattening out demand and therefore meeting environmental um, targets. So in preparation we designed an information visualization um, and it shows one possible household's energy consumption for one week. Um, the colors in there represent the different uh, price bands so uh, at each point in time, that's what price band is in operation. Uh, size represents um, amount being consumed. Don't worry too much if you can't see the detail. Um, there is a, there's a detail view from each of those hourly buttons. Uh, and, we, and we were showing them in cost and in consumption in uh, kilowatt hours. Uh, and an alternative view showed them the, an overview for the day with, with the details for each appliance and for classes of appliance. So you can kind of get some idea um, that we were allowing them to explore in quite, quite close detail um, the consumption of this household. And I'll put that in kind of quotes. So how did we get them to explore the data? What were the activities that we were taking, uh, we were driving them through? Um, so there were four key activities. And in the first of these, we asked each of our groups, and we had them working in groups of three or four, we asked them to look through the data, use, use the visualization we tool, tool we'd given them, to decide who they thought the household that had generated this energy might be. And we gave them tools to build a collage, and I'm going to run through that in just a second, um, in order to describe this household. So what we wanted them to do was to seek insights in the data and then use their creativity and their understanding of the context in which en energy is used to describe the household that, it, that it was represented in the visualization. And then after that, we wanted them to look again at the data, look again at the consumption and see how this household that they'd imagined could use their energy smarter. In what ways could they change their behavior so that they could save money or save energy? 
And then we ran through some stuff with attitudes to different kinds of smart home data, what it could be used for, how they felt about it, what would, what would it mean that it was being collected, where would it be kept, things like that before finally going on to some service design ideas. So I'm going to run through the outputs from Activity 1 and Activity 4 in a bit more detail because they're probably the most interesting. So as I said, what we'd asked them to do in the first activity was to think about who it was that was represented in the patterns of energy consumption. And we gave them a bunch of photographs, some, some shapes, various kind of uh, ambiguous uh, stimulus um, to build up a collage with the described who they, who they were and what we were after. Yeah, sorry, excuse me, one second. What we were after was a rich description of a household um, that, just, that was built up from, from what they'd seen in the data combined with their understanding of how energy is consumed. And each group had been given the same visualisation which represented the same data, but the data was uh, an amalgamation of different households, so there was no real answer as to who this household was. But what we found was that each of the groups identified different, in uh, different insights that they thought important and coloured those with the stories behind the energy consumption that told us quite a bit about how they felt about energy and its use and came up with some fairly different kind of households, but each of which had a, had a strong story that followed through from the things they'd seen into what they thought was important and how they showed it. And then towards the end of the day, when we were, when we were getting to generate design ideas, um, and we were, the outputs were of a similar format, except what we were doing here was we asked them to describe the service at three key points. Um, so at the point of sign-up, um, when they first use it, and when it becomes uh, an, uh, an essential part of their life, a, a, an accepted part of their life. And what we were looking for here was that the ideas that they picked up at the beginning were carried all the way through into the actual service design idea. So we were looking to see whether insights from data would go through all the activities of the day and show up in the service design ideas. And again, this was pretty successful. What happened was that people did take the ideas that they thought they threw, they developed them, and they came up with different ideas based on what, was, what they'd seen in the data and what was important to them. So we'd, we'd got them to describe their understanding of uh, the same set of data uh, and tell us something about how they felt energy was consumed. So it was uh, engaging, it was useful, it, was, it allowed people to explore the data. Um, and it was effective stimulation for creative activities. That was good. We like that. Um, so I should say there's a little bit of a caveat. We, 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 were, we were looking for ideas that were uh, novel as well as appropriate, so maybe a, higher, a slightly higher level of creativity that we've got um, out of it. However, it did stimulate, it did support their creativity, um, and it did make things accessible and engaging. So I have, yeah, I have a couple of minutes. So I'm going to run through some of the stuff we've learned in other places. So we've also been looking at things like ambiguity in the design of the visualizations we use. Now, ambiguity is often closely linked with creativity, particularly the ability to work through ambiguous situations. Um, and, and also in design workshops where ambiguous stimuli such as kind of uh, basic paper shapes um, even kind of post-its and pens, things like that, uh, have shown to be, allow people the space to represent their ideas and talk about their experiences in a way that's meaningful to them. So we thought it would be worth looking to see whether ambiguously designed or more ambiguously designed visualisations would enable people to be uh, more creative in the ideas that they generated. However, what we found was that, uh, that the greater ambiguity reduced the support for sense-making. So where there was more analytical behaviour, where people were actually looking to, uh, to seek insight, the ambiguity had a negative impact on that. So the more traditional kind of style of, of, of visualisation was proven to be more successful there. So I'm going to run through this quite quickly. We were also looking at different interaction styles, 
So whether a slow or more ambient style of interaction with a representational style that was more based on imagery, whether that, because we were looking at, at how um, you could juxtapose, juxtapose ideas that weren't necessarily obviously connected, um, and the idea of making connections from things that aren't necessarily uh, connected is quite key to creativity. So we were looking to see whether that would drive uh, our participants to, whether that would stimulate their creativity in, in more novel ways um, than the kind of traditional information visualizations we'd been looking at before. But again, what we actually found was that the nature of the activities we were running meant that the exploratory style provided better kind of creativity support. Um, and this, this, was, this was support for the creative processes that were going on. So people's, so how they were describing how they felt that the different tools supported them through the workshops. And that's kind of quite important because we need them to feel comfortable. We need them to feel like they're gaining something out of, out of the stimulus that we give to them. And that's what we feel was important here, that, that, that with this more exploratory style, they have greater control, uh, and that makes them feel more confident uh, about their interactions and how they're working. So, it's all a bit early. Can't give you any great conclusions. Um, but we kind of feel that this is important because this kind of data is playing an increasingly important part in um, life in general, but in, in the way... Uh, organizations are looking to solve problems. So one of the things we'll be doing is looking at uh, a more longitudinal study to see how, how ideas throughout a whole design process uh, are maintained, whether the insights that are found at the beginning are still relevant um, sometime further down the line. Um, but also still interested in, in how we can stimulate more novelty. Um, and I think... Currently, what the, the, the thinking is that we'd like to go back to looking at things like ambiguity and interaction style and imagery, but with different kinds of facilitation. So perhaps people need to be talked through uh, exploring the wider possibilities in a much more facilitated manner than we've been doing so far. Thank you. Thank you very much.